Well, I know Chris in the lower one. Yeah, as well. Uh, let's see. Well, Chris is on there twice. I'm just looking to make sure we have our body. One, two, three, four. We have Nancy. So we have, we actually have enough. <laughs> Nancy waves. Hi, Nancy. Oh, oh there's Stephanie. Thank you. All right. Okay. So we can begin with the the budget workshop. Okay. Very good. And Denise is online as well. Denise, we Denise, yeah, can we be looking at something in particular? Yeah. Okay, this is our second budget workshop. We have um, our cost centers, administration, uh, all remote for any questions that you may have particular to their area, um, their cost center area. I just want to review that our, uh, so some of our priorities going into the budget were social emotional learning and supports literacy, and then health and safety, like our facilities, um, different types of things that we've done over time or need to do uh, to continue to move our facilities ahead. So those were our main areas of, of focus. Uh, we looked back and we didn't have any questions per se, but are there general questions or specific cost center questions? We have everybody, everybody's out there. I have two questions that are uh, the general or specific. Um, the first one is I would like to just throw it out for discussion to not cut the, that guidance. Um, I, I think it was actually a total of one and a half maybe, but um, I, I just like to throw it out there to not cut that position and see how people feel about that. I, I understand that it might not be necessary because we move some things around in that particular role, but I, in guidance as a whole, um, I just have been struggling to see how that's not a needed position somewhere in the district. Um, so that's one thing, just uh, we can discuss, I'm not sure what that process is. And then um, the other one is, do we have anything in here that is geared towards support for teachers. Um, I guess, especially in light of this year, and even if next year resembles normal, it's we know it's still not going to be. Um, so I'm just wondering what kind of support we have for the mental health of teachers, I guess. I'm not sure what the... Sure. So I'll start with the, correct the first <laughs> question is, we... Um, we can talk about those those position those counseling or guidance positions, but the we are getting more funding coming in as part of the stimulus package. So we were going to really take a look at where our social emotional learning needs and supports are, and that may be contracted services, that may be more supports with our second step program that we're doing at the elementary level. Um, so really looking at honing in on the needs. And if it's like adding a counselor position or if it's contracting out for services, we're certainly you know, intending to do, to look at that and make that one of the priorities that we do. That's also one of the things that we need to do as part of some of the um, requirements coming out with some of these new funding pieces is to look at social emotional, um, to look at educational recovery, which is part of the social emotional piece. Is there a type of like foot foot holder that you could not cut the position and then evaluate based on what you get for um, stimulus money and based on where the school year goes to see whether or not to fill the position? Because we don't really know what the after effects of this year are going to be. Right. In that regard. So and what I mean by foot it's like a placeholder, maybe we don't fill it right away, but Let's not take it out completely until we know for sure that it's going to be filled in another means, either by the stimulus money, or that we don't suddenly three quarters into the year or halfway into the year realize that the after effects of COVID and we need it. 
So we can certainly do that if that's the wish of the board. Uh, some of the funding that we're getting goes until 23, fiscal year 23. So that does give us a lot of time to, we don't have to, it's not like some of these other grants that we've had that have to be used within three to four to five months. We have a couple of years to kind of get through that. So we were going to come up with a real strategic plan for that. But if it's the wish of the board to put it back in, to hold that, that we certainly can look at that. So I'm all about uh, the guys who don't need to, I don't want to lose a guidance position, but so, it sounds like they're going to have a, a, a plan to, to have that guidance position in there. I don't like the idea of putting a placeholder in and, and lack of better terms, having plump money sitting in there. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're not doing our job by allowing this plump money to be in there. Um, if it's not needed and they're suggesting that they don't need it because, not because of what social emotional is going on out there, but for the structural of their school, if they don't think that they need it because they're going to have this other plan in there, I'm okay with it being cut because it's going to be added into the grant or the. the so just to be clear money. too, like for clarity, I, and I, and Linda and I chatted about this today. We have six guidance counselors at the high school right now, correct? We've had six guidance counselors this year and we will have six guidance counselors next year. One social worker that's through our special education world, one social worker next year as well. So the cuts actually aren't current cuts. We did um, eliminate a position last year. And so that, so so we're, everything's gonna remain status quo for us. This says it's 11. So that's a half a position in Lebanon, which is um, yeah. There's it's 1.5 total between everything. Um, however, what's that? Well, the multiple pathways one is the one that yeah, because um, it was grant funded and what I think happened, and I might be wrong, is that we just actually didn't remove it from the budget fully this past year. So it looks like a pact, even though we physically have not had that body in the building. Um, that's not to say that we couldn't use as many guidance counselors and social workers as, as possible. Um, but I do think that ESSER funds that we have, um, that we know we're getting because we have a, a certain percentage that came in, and then the, the, the new piece with the, uh, is it the Rescue Act, is that what we call it, um, I think we'll be able to implement um, more support services that will at least get us through 23 and then we can actually evaluate everything clearly for the board. Um, so, you know, I, mean, I understand what you're saying, Travis, about in terms of placeholders. Um, so it, it really is up to the board about what they're thinking and how they want to go forward with that. Yeah, I don't want to strap us by cutting a position that's we're going to lose that counselor. We've already don't have those positions because they're already there, and we have avenues to add to what we need for this social emotional that we know we're going to get in when the school year starts in September. Mm -hmm. I think I think I'm okay with the way that they presented it in the budget right now. And can I just say that even though the position is no longer there, we have still been meeting the needs of students through the multiple pathways grant. So a lot of these kids don't have insurance and can't get out of school counseling. And frankly, that's what most of them need. So we've been able to draw on grant funds and contract with Sweetser to be able to get social work services through our grant. And perhaps that is something we can continue with some of this stimulus money. Because um, I think that's the most helpful thing. The frustrating part is when we have kids who don't have insurance, who clearly need clinical intervention, and the parents can't get the insurance, they don't qualify for main care, and it's a huge process to go through Katie Beckett and reapply, and I mean, it takes somebody to help facilitate that whole process for them. So for us to just say, we're gonna contract 10 sessions through Sweetser with the social worker, then we're able to do that. Um, and I think we get a lot more bang for our buck that way, personally. You know, I'm okay if it, it sounds like it's just sort of how we're funding it. Um, I just 
didn't want to see any cut to that support system. So if we feel like we have a better system in place, um, then I'm okay with that. It look, and it looks counterintuitive, right? In the budget, it does. Yes, especially when we said so our focus is on social emotional yeah. and literacy. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Any other comments on that? And then just my other piece was, and maybe this is part of what you addressed, but just to make sure that we have, or I don't know, just asking if we have some kind of support in here for staff as well. But I, I don't, maybe that comes from the money that we would be getting in as well. Well, and, and determining what the appropriate supports are, right? Because it's, it's different actually per, at every grade level, and, and teacher, like teacher supports are a little different. So it would give us the flexibility to be able to Do provide any examples of the types of things that you're looking at? Well, earlier this year, we did some work around um, how to support staff as they're working with children with trauma yeah. and um, challenges. And that was really well received by the staff. And just kind of continuing on the path of not just how to work with students in the moment when you're, you're working with a high energy or a, a complicated kind of profile, but also how do you then take care of yourself going through that. And um, those are things that the buildings are very aware of and, and have done work on continuously the last couple of years. So just carrying on that work. Um, yeah, yeah. The self-care piece is huge right now. So uh, like I met um, this afternoon with a teacher who's just, um, there's just a lot going on, right? But not only in, in a school setting, but in just in your own personal lives. We're all struggling with, um, I don't know, it's like the, it's like the fatigue that COVID has brought to us. And so we've been talking about like what support services we can provide to teachers just on an individual basis as they need them. Um, and again, it's kind of like this whole idea about um, individual supports, contracted services, what's gonna be the best, you know, um, for each particular um, scenario. Um, you know, but then we also are working on just like, um, you know, school level, um, I, don't, I don't even know how to put it, but just like school, school level um, team building and bringing people together and supporting each other and dealing with the fact that we can't actually touch one another. And there's that whole piece of just, just of not being able to socialize in the normal way is impacting everybody. Um, so yeah, all of that comes into play. Those are my two questions. We've started with a sign up for kindergarten. Do we have any, are we able to change any of our projections there? Or are we looking like we're going to be on path? Or are we? So, I'm going to throw it out to the, to the right. So, yes, we do have some numbers. Some are higher in areas than others. Yeah. So, Mike, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Fill us in on yours. Oh, they're all present talking about the kindergarten piece. Go ahead. Uh, we have right now we have 47 kindergartners registered, which is typically we're in the mid to high 30s right now. So we're really high. Uh, interesting of those 47, we have 33 boys. So it's <laughs> if you have a sense of how many of those um, might have entered kindergarten this year. Uh, we we had eight kids. We call them red shirts. Um, <laughs> eight kids red shirted. I like it. And so we were able to we were able to reach out to those families, and they are all registered. Okay. What's your with your current staffing level? What would it be the numbers before we had to add that other position? Do you think the ball within our students? If we get to, if we get to fifty four, that puts us at that that break. And it's just really tricky because summertime, historically, August, we have some trickling. So, you know, if you we really 18 is a lot of kindergartners in, a, in one classroom. And yeah. so if we if we get to that 17 and some change with three classrooms, it doesn't take much to get over that number. That's too much. So 
really that's where we're, 51 is is really the the ceiling of where we want to be comfortable and stay there and i'm not opening any doors with this question at all <laughs> but are you using like regular time classroom numbers yes yeah okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Melissa, you want to go? Sure. We are at Huzzy, we're above 70. So we are um, higher than normal for right now. So we're above around 70 ish kindergartners right now. Um, we do have a, hand, a few that may have come in this fall, a couple that are curious about possibly being first grade or whatever. So we've got some stuff that we're trying to figure out for sure on some of the different kids and where they came in last year, but we're above 70 already. So, and they have, um, on the books, they have seven sections of kindergarten. Um, if it stays at 70, then we'll probably reduce to six, but, and then we'll figure sure. that out. But, but it's not typical that we stay at seven. Yeah, we'll ramp up. We'll ramp up for sure. 40 or, yeah, you know, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then Patty. Hi, uh, we are actually down a little right now. We have 42 kindergarten students registered. Usually we're probably 10 more than that. Um, and typically we land in the high 60s, low 70s. Um, we have four sections. So right now that would only be like 10 or 11 students in a class. I'm sure we will get more. We do appear to be down a little. And when I did a quick glance at birthdays, it doesn't appear that we have any students registered that would have qualified age-wise to come this year. Patty, do you know if you had um, any kiddos that, as Mr. Archambeau says, red-shirted? Like, are there kids missing? Not that I know of. Right. Um, we didn't have a lot that, that, I think they chose to homeschool their child this year rather than keep them out. So I thought I was going to ask that. Do we know? Do we have numbers on like not not remote learning, but actual homeschooling, and uh -huh. are we seeing any transition from that to coming in in person? We need. Have, we, we, we had well, like three homeschool kindergartners this year, so. Um, when we were thinking of our numbers for this coming year, we kind of added them in thinking that there's a good chance they may come back. Some families told us that they would come back once we had everyone back in school and then some we haven't heard from in that regard. So I can tell you that, um, through this a little bit quickly. Oh, uh, let's see, Tim. It is just a right, like we absolutely have a higher number of homeschoolers this year than we have had. And, and, and that's the case in York County. Yeah, for sure. Everywhere. Yeah. So where the heck is my I'm kind of lost here? Okay. So um yeah. I'm gonna go by age really quick and filter that. But yeah, so she, it looks like there's not a huge amount. You just had the three, right? In, in kindergarten. I know in Lebanon, and K to five, according to my re records, we have 22 students yeah. homeschooled. Right. And in oh. general, K to, uh, well, just K to 12, we're at like, crazily in the in the like the 60s it's a lot of kids much more, more yes much more um than normal yeah and a lot of those that came in this summer said as we'll we'll we're coming back we're coming back <laughs> yeah coming back yeah all right Denise, do we have any updates for the draft at all? And you with all the tweaks that have been going on, where are we at with any of that? Okay, so um, one of the things we wanted to let you know was um, due to a recent decision um, 
by the USDA who runs our school nutrition thing, our program. Um, and Abby can speak more to it if, if we need more detail, but um, due to their decision to extend summer feeding um, July through September, Abby and I discussed the potential shortfall for that program. And at this point, we are comfortable taking out the 102,000 from the district budget. So we would reduce the district budget by that payment. Um, we think uh, with this coming summer running similar, I think, to last summer, if we're feeding families, um, then we think we'll be closer to a $400,000 deficit at this point. Again, this is not knowing how they're going to treat the, the school year. But um, so we think we're able to take out that 102, which is a good thing. Um, we also received an email this week um, indicating that the, um, the medical rates will be provided to us on or about April 6th and that the top tier was 4.2% for the worst loss ratio ratings. So I don't think we fall into that by any means. So we should see some savings there. April 6th, you said, so that yeah. puts us right before. Right. Yeah. close to when we got finalized. Right. Yep. Mary so, Ellen and I have it. We got it. Sounds like you're going to be up all night that night. <laughs> I don't think we have it. That meeting, that Thursday. Yeah, yeah, we're on the 8th, right? Yeah. We have to inform the budget on the 8th. Yep. Yeah. But it's all right. She'll, it's not a big crunch, honestly. No, it's just yeah. going to go right up. We'll get it done. And that's what I have for updates this week. Those are nice updates. Thank you. Yeah. We like those. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so, uh, oh, screw life. Michelle. She's there. Did I find her? I think. Yes. <laughs> yeah, she is. <laughs> so, can you? sell that fourth grade position right now? <laughs> well, so the position, as my understanding, is not off the table. We have taken it out of the Knowlton budget and we'll look at numbers and um, decide if we need it or we don't need it once we have kind of the kindergarten numbers and my numbers. Um, so I don't feel like at this point it's a loss. I think we're just looking at, is it going to be necessary? So it is in the budget. So, so, so it's well, not no, currently so in the budget. It's there's the, a position the in the budget. Position is out, right. but there is a kindergarten yeah. placeholder that's in there that yeah. might be able to move to this fourth grade. Exactly, that's exactly but it right now. From what I just heard from our kindergarten teachers, yeah. unless Burroughs comes in really low, Mike's going to need that teacher potentially. Yeah. If yeah. that's the case, Michelle, are you going to really need a, that fourth grade teacher? Um. So uh, the numbers. Currently, if we have the five that we've always had, so I'm not looking to, um, no one's getting cut. It would be an additional position. Um, with the numbers I currently have, class sizes in that grade five could be 21-ish. Um, we've definitely had 21 before. It's It's been done. If we go to six, then we get down to kind of between 17 and 19. So, I, Denise, if I recall, 50,000 is a half a percent? Um, 50 or 1 percent is approximately $50,000, give or take. 1 percent. So if if we were to take five percent down to four percent, we we would see approximately a fifty thousand dollar savings. Okay. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm getting my percentage and numbers yeah. all mixed up. I'm talking about the base taxpayer percent. If we were, if you took out that hundred thousand dollars, right? What are we looking at a, a taxpayer? Oh, one moment. <laughs> Let 
look at it, which we're watching our brains work in. If, if we take out 102,000, we are look, that's the, the school nutrition. We're down to 4.29 to taxpayers. If we were to take out, say, another 100,000 maybe, right, two percentage points to three, yeah. um, we'd go down to 3.81. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is do we want to leave that here. He wants to leave a position I, I think, I think, yeah, I think everybody's trying to figure out where I'm headed. Yeah. Where we've got that $102,000 that we're saved right now, do we put that fourth grade position in there, even knowing that we don't really know where our kindergarten numbers are. Burrick might be low. Lebanon might be low. I don't think there's enough teachers to move a Lebanon classroom around, but um, it sounds to me like that position that we currently have is going to end up having to go to Mike and North Burwick. 21 kids in fourth grade is not an astronomically high number, but the classes are small. And if we have any restrictions on us putting in place in the fall, so we're going to fit 21 kids in some of those classrooms. She's going to have to work our magic to move some of these classes around. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we need to make the decision right now, but I think it's something that we need to think of and before that April 8th or 9th right. meeting. Well, we, can, we want to put that in or not. Well, should we, at our next meeting, are we going to have sort of um, like an updated total to look at and then what's the what do we call the, the, the list decision sheet the dish, the, yeah um like should we should we do you want to start a decision sheet we and have that, 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 that consideration yeah, yeah. 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 And then we sort of dealt with all of those right yeah. right now. I, I think it would be helpful so we've got the insurance and the lunch the mm -hmm. food money and then so that's the take out, and then the positive, the other yeah. side of it would be, do we leave, do we add in a teaching position? It's, it's kind of a little it's similar to the guidance, guidance team, effort, yes. except for the differences that... Uh, We're running down the same path. We are running down the same path, but... So I, I just wanted to say to your first part, to the first part of your comment, Denise, I don't think I will have an updated budget because I won't have the medical rates yet and there are still lots of other moving parts but really the things we know about are one lump, you know, lump sum. So I can real time, again, like I just did, I can add an in and out things that you're considering so that you can see where that percentage goes. Exactly, and then yeah, with the impact. Yep. So if you wanted to give me a scenario where we take out the 102 and we add back in a fourth grade and we take out two percentage points for medical, I mean, those are I the can, things that I've heard so far, right? Unless there's... Well, we've had some adjustments with staffing as well. We've, we've changed some of the ways that we handle our kindergarten staff or our staffing in general, as well as we've lost some people and we're gonna have to hire new people. So I would assume there's gonna be some salary savings in that process as well. So sometimes some of the savings we have already seen, um, for example, the guidance position at Knowlton, where it was a very senior teacher is re being replaced by a newer or a new, uh, very senior guidance counselor replaced by a new guidance counselor who is not taking medical and so we've already have that factored in. So there's there might be some savings, but it's not something I would put to the bottom line right now, I guess. Yeah, it's not drastic, but there's, there are some percentage. There might be some, yeah. We, again, we have some of them in already, some of them we don't. <clears throat> Does anyone else on the board have any either questions, budget questions, or I guess, yeah, budget questions, or thoughts on any of this stuff? Um, I just wondered about the Green Club in uh, at the Hanson School. It looks like we don't have it on for the year 22. It's going to be gotten rid of. I just wondered um, what, you know, for the decision there, why are we getting rid of that? It was more from the person that created it that she's no longer at our school. And so that's, that's why it's not there. 
and there hasn't been another staff member that has had the time to step forward to do it. So for next year, it's not in there. That was my next question, so thanks. <laughs> Uh, Actually, I've got one more thing, too. I, I'm looking through because now that I need to find it, I can't. Um, <laughs> there's that one tab. You know how it, it's got some of the, the projects on it, and it has the ones that are being put forth on for this year, and then it has others that are just future, whenever going to happen. You know, it's just on the list, but not going through for this budget. Is there a way to get uh, a draft of that, of, of showing just the ones we're putting on the budget? Sure. sure, I can do that for you. Thank you. Speaking of that, I was actually that's kind of where I was going to head in a second. Was, are we able to, and I have no idea what our current budget projections are right now as we're getting closer to the end, but are there some of these projects, I know you guys are always monitoring that, are there some of these projects that we can slide into this, this year's fund balance so we don't have exceed our fund balance limits? I think that's a good question, Travis. I think we're still in March a little too early to kind of make those projections. Um, we're still, you know, we've still only getting um, utility bills, for example, in February. We haven't finished our oil season. Like there are a couple of bigger things that will need a little bit more time, but it's definitely something we'll take a look at as we get into the spring. So I guess my question would be to Kevin is, uh, if we're able to hide, or not hide, if we're able to put some of these projects in this year, are there projects to replace the ones uh, that you're requesting for, or would we be able to cut that back some? Can you, can you ask that one more time for me, Travis, just so I can understand you a little better? And so if we're able to get some of these capital projects in this budget, this current budget, do you have other projects that we're kind of pushing off um, to say next year that you can put into this proposed budget project list? Yeah, because we, we've trimmed some of them already that we'd kind of put in the first draft of the budget. Um, then we came to the second draft, we had cut some out. So obviously the ones that you know we, we cut out out of the first part of it, I'd like to try to put back in, obviously. I also would just like to mention and remind folks that we are still dealing with a couple hundred thousand dollar loss for school nutrition this in fiscal 21. And that is something we still have to cover before we even consider adding more. And I, I think you mentioned this last time, but I can't remember. The SRF 500,000, we talked about seeing if we could spread that out. Is that, did we determine whether that was possible or not? So I, the what I've done is I've taken a look at the, um, the contractor we have has broken out our payments to them over the course of the project over the next year. And all I believe all of the payments need to be made by May. So it will I think that that whole amount will be in the fiscal 21 budget and not be able to be carried forward into 22. Thoughts, guys? Any other questions? So, thoughts, comments? So, for next week, or when we come back, uh, just an update again on kindergarten to see what's happened in the, in the week, and then to talk about the fourth grade, the, the Knowlton position. That sounds like it's something that we want to keep discussing. Yeah, and I do think um, if we could just get from Denise sort of the, with those few things that are in there, um, what that does to the overall yep. percentage. Okay. So just so we have it now, if I, if I take out the 102 for school nutrition, if I take out two percentage points on medical for $100,000, 
And if I add back in, I don't know if, I think it was the grade four position we had talked about. Um, that brings us to a 4.15% increase to taxpayers. And where were we at? 4.79. And Denise, what did you say it would be if you took out the 102, the 100, and then the sub, and then if we did not, um, three point was it three point eight one? It was three point eight one. And that's still the three percent placeholder, which we still. I'm still hoping. Yeah, I'm still hoping we could go lower than that. Well, I'll be dancing if we go lower. <laughs> I'm hoping for a zero. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so set yourself up for sad. <laughs> Is it so, going forward, today's the 25th. Where are we in the process? Um, so we have next week, which is a regular meeting, but we we can do an update. Yep, next week. If there's any other questions or people think of things, well, I guess we would have to, right? Because then you're saying we need to finalize it on the eighth. Yeah. Oh, we yes. have a working meeting. Awesome. Can you will you will you remote in for us? And we'll make it done. Thank you. Everybody behave themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, we can finalize prior to if we feel like we can, but we really want to get to the sixth and find out what that insurance looks like. Yeah. Right. So I, I can give you general idea of of where we stand next week on the first. Again, I think if it if it's possible, if we could decide everything within our control on the first, that'll give me the next week to put through the changes you want to to accurately reflected. You know, all of these are estimates at right. this point. Um, it will give me time to put through the medical premiums and bring to you uh, hopefully a budget on the 8th, a new draft um, that we can approve at that point. But it would be helpful, I think, if we could um, talk through some, any of the other questions or, you know, dis positions that you might be interested in that sort of thing next week, maybe. No, I had a couple of pages, but I called Sue earlier. <laughs> well, they were all, I think, reason, like, you know, I told them, I said, you can ask those out loud, you know, you don't have to just say, but they were all about student and staff support stuff and where the fluctuations were for the most part. And there was the, uh, the main finance part. piece where the, I mean, the facilities piece with where this, um, the $500,000 got tucked in there. Right. And those are, those are biggies, I think. Yeah, I think one the, the, the $500,000 had to get put, I don't know where, but had to get put in somewhere. Yeah, it's in the facility section. Because um, yeah. it was over what we expected from the grant. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It looks like a $429,000 increase to facilities when it's 500000 chunk of it is the, is the sprinklers. So I think if I understand what we're talking, we've got the fourth grade teacher that's kind of a placeholder decision yeah. issue and yeah. then the guidance, or are we moving forward with the guidance without the guidance? I think we got an answer to the guidance with it. I mean, I think the, the question is, are you comfortable with that? So yeah. when I'm you're comfortable with it if we, if we, have if we really do it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no reason not to really do it. Like, you know, the finances will be there. And then honestly, I feel like it's really important for us to develop more relationships with con with services outside of us to have ongoing supports. Um, it's bigger than just a one person yeah. support system here, you know, or, you know, like adding, would you guys say no to a new guidance counselor? No. But is it really like the big picture support that we need? I'm not sure. I think we really need to develop that community base. <laughs> Just having money we can draw on yeah, when right. kids need more than what the school can provide. Yeah. And parents. Well, I think that's what we're funding. Yeah. Suggesting. Yes. You know, is to make sure that we do have the funding yeah. to do that. Yeah. That would be fabulous. 
Because yeah, right now it's just M MP students because it's a multiple pathways right. grant. So if yeah. we could expand that, that would be wonderful. Because we have a number of students who need services, but parents don't have insurance, and then they can't get right. them. So oh, and the way that just gets involved, and it becomes ugly, and you know. And the way this would read, I think, is that we could look solidly at adding in um, outside of our budget in the ESSER funds. Um, you know, basically, I. I, I, I a decent amount of money to support contracted services. And then we would have to, like, I think the other piece is this gives us time to evaluate how actually beneficial that turns out to be and how we can continue to support that once those funds run out. Um, so. so it's really just a fourth grade teacher, kindergarten teacher aspect that we have left in our right, yeah. and, yeah. and, yeah. and the health insurance. And, right. uh, and uh, watch. I assume we're not going to get any more on the school nutrition until later, like beyond the budget. Um, I can let Abby speak to that maybe, but um, I haven't heard anything from anyone in in this at the state about that. Can you repeat that again? I know we, we got an update that we can feel that we are comfortable getting rid of 102 after they've I think they said till September was the last yeah. question. Yeah. Do we think we'll hear anything else for the, till December or till June before we move forward in the budget? Or I don't. I don't think we're going to know anything soon. I know that they are working on re maybe restructuring the national school lunch program, which would extend past September. But I don't know, and I don't really. They haven't really given much guidance as to when they might use that. If I had to take a guess, it wouldn't be until May, June-ish, which would be after the fact. So they haven't really given much information at all, unfortunately. So it sounds like we need our elementary school teachers to push hard to get all their registrations in yep. now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful. Okay. Okay. All right. So, are we closing our budget workshop? Yes. Anyway, have, um, before we do that, do we want to give the opportunity for any of the administrators if they have anything last? Oh, yeah. yeah. This is your opportunity, administrative team, to ask if there's stuff that you're like. I, Linda and I chatted earlier today, and she was feeling like to be sure that. Um, if there's something that you feel like you need that's not in the budget, now's the time to talk about it. I hear projects. <laughs> Just for the moment. I can't be that. Somebody wrote something. Mike, what did you put on this? Mike wrote something. He's all set. Everything you need. Kevin, what do you have? Kevin. Surprised he didn't ask for a new truck. <laughs> Does um, school nutrition or um, adult ed folks, do you have anything that you want to check? Because obviously you guys, that's a different budget. Right? So is there any questions on school nutrition or adult ed? I mean, I have a million questions on school nutrition, but... I don't think they're gonna. Yeah. I, mean, I don't even. I don't. I'm not even fully understanding what happened this year yet. So yeah. I. <laughs> I think that's a fair year for all of us. We haven't. It's been very. Um, yeah. It's been I very think my. I just would say that I trust you guys to be working that through. So. But I. I. I can't. Wrap my head around enough to even question what's in there. How about you, Abby? Can you wrap your head around it enough to ask what's in there? <laughs> in the school nutrition, like what to ask for or what what happened this year? No, no, no. So what happened this year? Can you? But don't worry about it. You know that you. It's hard to explain. Yes. Uh, supply and demand. <laughs> That's what happened. Yeah. Um, who knows? Yeah, I was. I think, Nancy, yeah, I think the question was, do you feel like you have everything you need in the budget for next year to the best of your knowledge currently? Yes, I mean, I think this year we definitely took care of in terms of equipment, you know, some important pieces of equipment, but I do feel, um, 
you know, we will be prepared in terms of staffing and labor. I think this year kind of put into perspective that this is the hardest part and I, I foresee a better future for next year. So I think we should be all set in that regard. And now we're a little more conditioned as to how to better operate. <laughs> Be away from you guys, just so I can read them more <laughs> easily. If that makes sense. We want to personally. I don't know. <laughs> She'll be right back. I'll be right in here. I'll just get hooked up. <clears throat> okay, so are we doing the Good Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Liberty and justice for all. Um, so, Nancy, are you prepared to read the public input statement? I sure am. Great. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the first public input session is a 15 minute session with each person having no longer than three minutes in which to make a statement. But a second public input session may be held at the end of the meeting if allowed by the board chair. The speaker will give his or her name, address, and reason for speaking. Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non-residents the opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning subject matter that falls under the law regarding executive sessions, for example, matters involving personnel, cannot be made during public input and just have to click on the link at the top of the agenda to submit your statement. Okay, give me a second while I figure out my world. Um, oh my goodness. We have quite a bit of public input tonight and I'm just gonna read them in order and let me see if I can get to them. Having a, uh, having a, a, a moment, sorry. Uh, here we go. All right. And here we go. Uh, Melissa Pass of North Berwick. Our track and field and cross country coaches have only ever wanted what is best for us. I cannot imagine them trying to be to deceive, over-exaggerate, or mislead. I have witnessed them help my teammates and me through bad days and grief, silly relationship drama, and serious mental health issues, through natural teenage angst and even self-destructive behaviors, and still be there to celebrate the euphoric moments with us, too. None of these are required in their job, and yet they have gone above and beyond. Though These men and women are likely are like my parents away from my parents discipline and love balanced. When they say that there is a problem and they would like to work toward fixing it, please consider what I have stated about their character before claiming their experience is false. Chantel Upton of North Berwick, I am writing to you as a concerned parent of a track and field athlete. I have known these coaches for many years and have been lucky enough to have two children be part of this wonderful family. My children are both three sport a year athletes and track and field was by far their favorite. These dedicated coaches create a true team environment where the athletes, who are mostly individual competitors, show more team spirit and support than any other team I've ever seen. To find out that not just one, but all the coaches are leaving is not only unacceptable, it is suspect. I find it questionable that no information was given about their resignations by the athletic director, who instead sent out an email filled with promises, but no actual plan to have experienced coaches in place by Monday. <clears throat> I'd like to know specifically what happened that drove at least three dedicated coaches to give their resignation. During the past year, these students have had so much taken away from them, and yet they have persevered and remained positive with the hope that they would eventually be able to get back to some sort of normal. To have that taken away because the adults, who are supposed to put the children's needs first, are instead playing a tug of war with budgets and egos is shameful. It is our responsibility to ensure these children do not suffer with inadequate coaches put in place as a band-aid. 
I implore you to rethink the actions that brought us to this place, put the children's best interests first, and give them the coaches that they know, love, and deserve. Um, Melissa DeWyron of Berwick. My name is Melissa DeWyron. My daughter, Isabella, is a senior at Noble. For the past four years, she has been a three-season athlete, with two of those seasons each year being indoor and outdoor track. I'm shocked and heartbroken by the recent news that our track and field coaches have resigned. This is unacceptable to me and should raise a red flag to our administration. For a coaching staff that has been as successful as the track and field coaches have been for so many years, to all step down is alarming, and I hope will shed light on a potentially bigger problem that could affect the future of Noble Athletics. I sincerely hope the situation is not taken lightly, and I expect that immediate steps will be taken to rectify the situation, however possible, to allow these athletes to compete finally to the end of this terrible and trying school year. <clears throat> Dan Lawrence, Sarah Stoll, and Mary McAuliffe have had a tremendous influence on my daughter. She would not be where she is today if it were not for them. They have become family to her. They support her on and off the track. She's planning to go to college at UNE as a track and field athlete because of the support, training, and confidence they have instilled in her. Watching this team walk into a track meet is so powerful. They enter and leave as a team. When an athlete is not competing, they are expected to cheer on and support their teammates, and that is what you see in every corner of the room. By the end of the meet, there have been so many times when one athlete from another team is still there and all their teammates have left because they were done competing, yet all noble athletes are still there cheering every single person on, even though 90% have been done competing for a while. It's a powerful sight to see. The standard that the track and field athletes are held to on and off the field help them to be better human beings, and I cannot imagine a season without these coaches. I believe if our administration and athletic department do not do everything that is in their power to keep these coaches and support them and their incredibly positive influence on these student athletes, they are making a horrible mistake that will have a negative impact on the future of Noble Athletics. It makes me sad to think that my younger children may not have the opportunity to compete under Coach Lawrence and his coaching team. Um, Sean and Wendy Fecto of Lebanon, uh, we would just like to express our concern for the Noble High School track program and the resignation of its coaches. Our daughter is a student athlete in several different sports. She's a very hard worker, but also very shy and always had trouble feeling like she fit into the team she was on until she joined Noble High School track. Coach Lawrence and his coaching staff have made track an incredible experience for her. She finally feels she is a true part of the team. This is an amazing track program with amazing coaches who have filled her with confidence and the desire to work even harder every day to make them proud. She has been pushed to work hard, but never without positive encouragement and praise from the coaches. We encourage you to try to find a solution to whatever the issue is within the program and to try to get these coaches back. These kids deserve the best after what they've endured this past year, and those coaches are the best. Molly Druge from Berwick. As a student athlete at NHS, coaches Lawrence, McAuliffe, and Stoll have made a positive impact on my athletic and character development in the two years they coached me. They are very caring and always took each athlete's needs into consideration. They set expectations as to what they wanted the track and field program to accomplish. They built a family environment of support. During practices and meets, they always pushed us to be the best versions of ourselves. All the coaches molded the program into a sport that many students are willing to try, develop, and excel at. I feel very strongly that Noble High School track will never be the same without them and hope they are given every opportunity possible to continue their amazing program. <clears throat> Heather Eastman of North Berwick, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Coach Lawrence and Coach Stoll as wonder leaders in the track and field team, but also in the classroom. Being a younger family, we have not had years of experience with these two. My oldest is currently a sophomore and has only had um, one tip but had only had them for one typical season. Since he was very young, he lived, breathed, and only spoke of soccer. In middle school, he joined the track team for off-season conditioning, but still loved soccer. His one season with winter track prior to COVID was incredible. Coach Lawrence and Stowell not only believe and encourage him, but encourage Dayton to believe in himself and his teammates. He frequently came home talking about how much he loved his team. It was in this season that he broke the news to us that he didn't want to participate in soccer competitively any longer. I know it was the influence that these two individuals had on him. Coach Lawrence and Coach Stowell are amazing teachers, whether in the classroom or on the track. This is a strong reason why the numbers of the track team are large. They are definitely unrecognized gems in our community and we need more like them. Incidentally, little brother who's in eighth grade has been looking forward to the day that he can be on a team with these wonderful coaches to work with. Thank you for listening. 
Uh, Don Crosby of Berwick. I'm concerned with the state of the NHS athletic teams. Parents and students were recently made aware that the track coaches resigned for the spring season. Recently, I saw postings for a number of vacant co coaching positions in SAD 60. This is deeply concerning in the spring, as the spring season is supposed to be starting in the next few weeks. We've lost coaches that were dedicated to the student athlete, um, motivated and challenged the kids, taught them teamwork, and they lead, and led an inclusive program. This has been a particularly challenging year for students, teachers, and coaches. The track and field team gives the students social interaction that they need, especially considering they are only in person at school one day per week. The coaches that recently resigned have been with the program for years, which leads me to believe that they don't, didn't resign because they were finished coaching, but resigned perhaps due to funding and support. Has the funding for the athletics changed due to the pandemic? Is there transparency into how the budget for athletics is allocated to each group? Are there any updates on the status of the vacant positions? Is there a possibility to bring these coaches back? We need to make sure that we're truly putting the kids first and thinking of their health and well-being. This is not a year to be cutting budgets and not supporting coaches. Um, let's see. Bruce Slater of Berwick. Good evening, my name is Bruce Slater. My son runs on the track teams, cross country, winter and spring. These coaches have been outstanding. My son always has been a runner, but these coaches have pushed him, encouraged him and celebrated with him. My son knows that he will be pushed. He knows they will guide him and offer insights. The resignation of all the coaches is a huge red mark on the school district. During winter track last season, there were over 90 students that were on the team. Last winter, I was able to attend all of the meets. I was able to observe a few things that were a direct result of the coaches. One, all team members marched in as a team. They stretched. They were just one unit. I asked my son why, and he said that the coaches will do anything to intimidate others. It was a team. Number two, I watched all the other teams sit with their backs to the track. They had their earbuds in and were talking to others while their backs were facing the track. I asked my son why Noble was not. His response was they were, they were there as a team, and they were there to support each other. If you were not able to see that, how you could... If you are not able to see, then how could you encourage, cheer, etc.? Number three, I saw the coaches all celebrating with each athlete as the athletes came out from their event. I saw how much the coaches celebrated, encouraged their students, regardless of their time or measurement. The smiles the athletes had on were so good to see. And number four, the coaches were just as excited as the students, if not more. I cannot express how upset and angry at the circumstances that have caused these great coaches to step away. This has to be resolved. Um, Rosanna Pass in North Berwick. Hello, I'm writing to let you know what a great loss our track and field stu students athletes are facing with the resignation of the coaches. I wish there was something to be done to ask these professionals back. I'm indebted to these individuals for what they have done for the, my two daughters, not only in terms of the sport and personal discipline, but more importantly to me in terms of their mental and emotional health in general. Through the years, I have also seen a good number of quiet, shy, or reserved students find a family or a place where they belong in both the cross country and the track and field programs. I greatly appreciate the efforts these coaches have made, always made to encourage su supportive and fun camaraderie that seems more and more rare at school. Unfortunately, also, wasn't it just last year that we went before this board in celebration of the track and field winter season accomplishments along with those of wrestling? Thank you for your time. Crystal Chasen from Lebanon. My family is devastated by the loss of the track coaching staff. I want to know why we did not fight for the staff to stay. Mr. Lawrence has taught my son and daughter more on that track in the school halls and meets about discipline, teamwork, life, pushing themselves to places they never thought they could go. He and his staff have built a champion program, and we are so sad they won't be part of this season. What is the plan? Where do we go from here? Where does the budgeted money not spent go. Sports are so important in our kids' lives, especially mine. It's what motivates my son in school. Please fight for our sports seasons and coaches. And our last piece from Isabella Higginson from Berwick. Good afternoon. My name is Isabella Higginson and I am a senior at the high school. I'm also a part of the Noble Track program and I've been a part of the team since I was a freshman. This team is a very important part of my life. A big reason it was so important was because of the coach's influence on me. They helped <clears throat> form me into the person I am today. They pushed me hard and helped me achieve my goals. Daniel Lawrence, Sarah Stoll, and Mary McAuliffe are some of the best coaches I've ever had. I've talked to many people this past week, and these coaches have made a positive impact on every one of them. The school is losing three amazing coaches, and they should be celebrated for their contribution and time with the athletic department. Thank you. So that's our public input. 
Um, what I do want to say, and Audra can speak to this as well, we um, we're actually working with the coaches. We um, Audra and I have met with them uh, this week and asked them to reconsider their resignations. And we've talked with them, and hopefully things will be resolved and looking like um, a typical team on Monday. That is our goal. I, I'm going to step back into the meeting, but Audra, if there's anything else you want to add? Well, hold on, Sue. There was one more email public comment to us that you did not read. Sue? She's coming. She's coming. We, yes, we, we will address that one. That one that um, there was a public input that came to, to email as well as, yes. So Sue Travis asked about the um, email that they received that- Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that email, I spoke with the person who sent it and she asked that I, she knows that you have received it. And she asked that we talk about it in our private session later. And I told her we would do that. So it's been retracted from public. Right, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. So we are going to have an executive session to discuss a lot of these public input mm -hmm. after, but it is going to be an executive session. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you for that. I will just continue to say that I believe that all public input is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, it makes me happy that people are writing, even if they are writing about things they are unhappy about. So. Mm -hmm. Um. Why we have public input. Yeah, it's just <laughs> the, for anybody that's listening, the board really, really appreciates all public input. Um, okay. I, 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 some of the ones that are like eight pages long, those were no. difficult. No. I, I still appreciate it. We appreciate them. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so all right, uh, the high school update. High school update. Mm -hmm. I think Audra shared a document with everyone on the board. Um, yes. I like, how, I like how it says final. Oh. You really <laughs> don't know. Oh, you think this is it tonight? Travis, the last one said final oh, too. <laughs> <laughs> we stuck an update in front of it, but hopefully this is the final final. <laughs> I'm sure you hope it too. Um, it's the first page is just sort of setting the date for today. And then um, the second page is just review. So we can kind of skip past that. It's just all the information that we went over um, at the beginning last time about what our current model is. So this really begins under scale up options. Um, and just to remind everyone, um, we went over two scale up options last time. Scale up option number one, and formerly known as scale up option number two, which it sounded like the board decided that sounded like we had eliminated that from sort of the, the menu. Um, so what you'll see tonight is a repeat of the original option one, which was the addition of grade nine on Wednesdays. And we'll review that um, because we left that meeting where I think that we were deciding whether or not we wanted to consider that um, depending upon what op the new remote um, component looked like. So. Um, we'll go back over option one. Um, AJ will go over option two, which was the request to improve those asynchronous remote learning days, so those days where kids are not face-to-face -face with their teachers to improve that time. And then option three is really, if you so choose, a combination of one and two. Um, so you may choose number one, number two, or number one and two together is kind of the idea. So, to review option one um, was the addition of grade nine kids on Wednesdays to give them an extra in-person day. And that would bring grades six, seven, eight, and nine all to those two days of in-person learning time. And we talked about that um, we would be able to implement that hopefully just before April break, depending upon Brenda's uh, routing of the buses and getting that going. And some of the trade-offs there, um, we don't need to necessarily rehash all of those, but they were significantly less than, than the other plan, although without some consideration. Uh, but we think that they're workable. All right, and, and I would just add the last bullet on that one is new. So just if you're kind of comparing the two, I want, you know, as we dove into it a little deeper, there was 
um, some disruption that happened with the Excel theater um, and the art schedule for grade nine students. So again, not a deal breaker per se, but it would it would be a, a small challenge to move things around um, to make that work. But that was just yeah. As in like their classes or so right now Excel um, art and Excel theater for grade nine students occurs on Wednesday. And so if we had them go to their regular noble classes, those meetings would be in conflict and probably have to be shuffled if they could be um, with those outside providers that um, help out those kids on those activities. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's a variable. Um, some of them continue beyond April break. I think one of them, the theater Excel stops at the April break. So it might be in conflict for a week or two. Um, but then wouldn't be, some of them would stay a little bit in conflict, but so just wanted to share that that was a new item that we had found in looking through bring grade nine in. And a typical school year, um, at times those kids are pulled out from their regular coursework anyways, um, but we just wanted to be transparent that if you hear about it, it's because we might have to finagle a little bit to get those rescheduled. So this whole time, have they been not getting pulled out? They've, it's actually been a designated time where they, they were, have been getting They were pulled able out. to plan it around the synchronous instruction. So, okay, so, so Adina was purposeful in putting, you know, grade eight and nine Excel arts, yeah. you know, whether it was National History Day or Art Excel, I'm seeing on here a flute Excel for some students, um, some additional lessons and things were put on Wednesdays because if they involve grade eight and nine students, then they knew there would be no conflict on Wednesdays. Just like the 10 through 12, grade 10 through 12 Art Excel were all placed on Thursdays to avoid any conflict on the Wednesday, Friday, in-person day. So that was just a purposeful design of this year. Once, once we went through that we went. Just for you guys too to know that we did put it oh, on the board wow. for folks to see. Thank you. Very nice. So it's presented to our public as well. Okay. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Okay, so again, great night on Wednesdays. Come on in for a second uh, day for them. And compared to the other plan, um, trade-offs seem to continue to increase. So. Right. Yeah. And then, so the second option, um, after talking last week and saying, hey, what would it look like if we could add some more synchronous time? Um, so this plan does add synchronous minutes of remote learning um, for core classes in grades 9 through 12, and 9 is in parentheses, you'll see, because we want to have a conversation because if grade 9 ends up coming in, maybe they wouldn't participate in the additional synchronous, that would be the additional time. So that's why you see it in parentheses there. Um, the, the sort of the pluses of this, or the outcomes that we would see, is increased student face time um, in that synchronous remote environment. Um, all students in grade 9 through 12 would receive the experience. So it would be sort of balanced across all four grades. Um, and so all students would attend um, a synchronous class. We, we set it at 30 minutes um, during block one, two, three, and four, whenever students had um, a core class. You can kind of see down below, and we can talk about it more after sort of the whys and the, what it means. Um, but any non-elective courses in science, social studies, English, math, um, and math would actually be all courses. We don't have math electives, um, so it would happen to be all math courses. Um, also including AP courses, senior projects, um, and any special ed intervention classes. Um, and then the trade-offs with this plan, um, it, it would mean a you know another schedule change for families to, to work with. Um, and, and, you know, one concern that we talked about, and I think it was the same as under um, bringing grade nine in, but Wednesday's a day where the um, majority of the district students are working remotely from home. So if we have situations that can become challenging, um, I can speak to the last two weeks as being challenging in my own house, having, you know, two children with very different schedules and very different plans, all having, you know, to log on at a certain time and the, you know, it's just tricky if it's been more of a, a baby sitting sometimes, the older sibling may be providing. This would put all of our 9 through 12 students some days in the synchronous world. Um, there would be some um, potential, I mean, and I think even, I think we've identified some conflicts that we would certainly see in trying to continue providing academic supports to at-risk students, um, both because their time 
that they be required to be logged in synchronously and their teacher's time to log in synchronously would just leave less time for some of those supports, um, especially I think the supports that are happening in person. Um, there would be a disruption to the Excel Theater and Arts, um, and there would be potential need for rescheduling of IEP services. So we think, in talking to our case managers, that they could change around a number of these appointments, um, but it, it's, it, would, it would need to happen if a student is you know, receiving a service at a particular time and has been for the last couple of months, you know, a reading intervention, maybe it won't work at the time it's been at. So I think questions from you guys is probably the best way to go. To okay, so I do have a couple of questions. Or a couple of questions. Yep. So what is the current block time of a regular class? It's about 80 minutes. 80 minutes. Okay, so yeah. we're talking about adding 30 minute blocks? Yes. Yeah. Yep, and I think just, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong with this, but kind of see your wheels turning with the, the timing of the blocks. Um, I think one of the issues and parts that are tricky with it is the travel for our vocational students is, is very challenging. So our AM students needing to get back into these classes and they're, they're driving themselves to make that happen. And then the PM students needing to leave what would be blocked too early to get to Sanford for the PM classes. Um, made it so that going the entire length of the block wasn't feasible for a large chunk of our students. Um, and then the other problem is the longer those blocks get, the less supports and interventions that can happen. Because if you're a student who has, you know, three of the four, four blocks in a given day, and you also receive some of these other services, the more time you're in a class, the less time you're receiving services. So that was what we were trying to balance in all of this is enough time to make it meaningful and worthwhile for kids to be there and interacting with their teacher, but also not sort of undercut a lot of the supports. So some of the trade-offs in that trade-off box end up being mitigated by the ability to reschedule because we didn't take up that whole chunk of time. So with the, that flexibility, many of those trade-offs potentially become non-existent. So, so hold on. Let, let me just let me just finish running through this just yeah, to make sure definitely. I understand it. So, so they're getting, and this does not apply to any electives. It's just not electives. Right. And so, just to play devil's advocate here for a little bit, we're not making the blocks longer than 30 minutes because the kids that are going to vote might miss them, but the kids that are going to vote are currently, these are currently empty days, so they're not, so this would, if they missed part of this, it would actually be, if they got 15 minutes, it would still be 15 minutes and they're actually, more than they're actually getting right now, but by not doing more because of the 25% of the kids that are in both, the 75% that are not. So part of it is that, so we ran a model under one of the original yellow plans where there was a vote conflict and teachers worked around that. Uh, they had kids coming in really late or missing things entirely and they set up a lot of different extra classes. What we found is that it made those kids really, really stressed out to be Which kids? Uh, the vocational students. We found that they were trying to join their classes while driving in their cars. Um, and then in terms of curriculum, like under this plan, it's really hard for a kid to come in really late into a classroom, virtual classroom, when everyone else has already been kind of going. And we tend to find that some of our vocational students, the ones who need a lot of that support, um, and it's, it's really hard for them to follow along when they're not with the rest of the gang in the class. And even though they represent only 100 to 150 students, they're spread out into many, many courses. Um, so it really affects all of the courses and the teachers trying to make sure that they're following the law and able to keep up. But so the alternative is for the other 75% of kids to say you're not getting anything. And and I, I'm, I think that we have done an absolutely phenomenal job getting the vote kids in that program all year. I've heard nothing but positive feedback, but I, I just, I, I don't. I can't fully understand why we were so set on not disrupting that that the other seventy-five percent of the kids are 
not getting anything. And I, I know it's not. Yeah, anything, no, no, no. And it's I think really, it really actually on those days we're talking about thirty a thirty minute class, so that the I, I don't know. Um, for some of the classes, it's not even all the classes. It's just the right. Just the and so I think part of the part of the balance that we're trying to weigh is making this time really valuable. And I think the tricky part is if the student, if, if in a given class a number of students are pulled, and again, maybe at 11, 12 it's both, but maybe at grade 9 and 10 it's special education services, or maybe it's whatever it is, I think the value and the quality of those classes decreases because the instruction is unlikely to continue moving along if a number of the students are unable to be there because of the schedule that we put in place but so here's how it goes. Travis is in Excel, so he's gonna he might be pulled out for theater Excel. Linda is going to Vogue, so she's she's got that. I'm just a regular kid. And I'm getting nothing because we are worried about like and and I and I'm yeah. all all of this everything matters. I just this me, the regular kid, is 75% of these kids. And so we're, we're more, I mean, I don't know if that's yeah. correct, but that was yeah. the wrong time. Sure, yeah. I, yeah. Two thirds, one third, I don't know what it is, but it's something around there. Right. And so I, but I like, if you look at a regular year, I'm not as familiar with how both works. I know we have a, a good scheduling system and it somehow works magically. But like, having been the parent of two Excel kids, they never had it. They always missed class time to go to Excel classes, and that was part of it. But you know what? It actually did stress them out from time to time. Sure. They just had to work. Hard. Like, yeah. yes, that was part. We never, ever, ever offered Excel that was not a pull-up from another class. So now what we're doing is, and again, I, I don't want to. I don't want this to seem like I'm opposed to Excel or Vogue or anything. Mm -hmm. I. I I think they're all wonderful, but what we're doing, we're doing the opposite now. We're, we're like, we, we know we've got a system in place for a couple of these smaller groups, but it might disrupt, but it might like be weird or inconvenient. And so the vast majority of these kids are not, I feel like we're leaving behind the majority of kids because we don't want to disrupt these two other systems. But the fact is that it's, you know, and I was thinking about the honors stuff from last week, and you know, from what I've observed, most of the time honors, if you were if you were in high school and wanted the honors designation, it was actually just more work within your class, and maybe once a week you got a nighttime meeting with the other honors kids, but it was just the even the rubric would say, you know, if you want honors, you have to do these extra assignments. It wasn't it wasn't like an extra period that you got it was just more work and so but now we've sort of carved out this extra time and we're worried about taking that away but i just i it still seems to me that the the vast majority of these high schoolers are getting left behind and i i, I know the scheduling is I know it's monumental, I really do. I'm not suggesting that you guys have not looked at this from all angles. And I know all of these programs are important. I just, you know, the we're at the end of March and I, I don't know. No, and I get it. And I think what we're trying to balance through all of this, and, and I, I do, we've had the same conversations about sometimes what starts off as these one-offs, if you will, you know, and, and that's sort of how it feels. This is a small subset of kids, but I think all of these different subsets add up. You know, we have, we now, and again, I'm sure it's only going to increase as the year goes along, we have over 70 students who are coming into the building for an additional day in a given week across just Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and again, that number is increasing. We had some older students in today, our ninth and tenth grade. So we like so those seventy are kids that you're talking about. That for the most part, there probably are a handful that are special education students. But for the most part, they are those regular kiddos who are just struggling to to do work remotely. You know, and then you've got the hundred and some vocational students, and then we've got our you know north of two hundred maybe special education students, and it's like. 
So by the time we're going through it, you know, that, that number, when we're looking at all of these different subsets, you're right, any one subset is relatively small compared to the, the general population of students in our building. But it's like, we're kind of looking through and adding up all of these subsets who are impacted. Um, and that's where it just becomes like, geez, do we, do we want to cut that entirely? Do we want to not be able to? So that's the, again, it's a balance. And that's a balance, a sort of tightrope, I guess, that we're trying to walk. Like we're not, you know, obviously we're not trying to give anyone the short end of the stick. You know, I mean, that, that is not our goal. I think we're, I think we, I don't think we're trying to give anyone the short end of the stick, but I, I think, you know, it's, it's always been a risk to be the kid that's not on anyone's radar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, and now we're just talking about the vast majority of our high school population is not on anyone's radar and they're fine. It's fine. I, I, don't think, fine. I don't think we feel that way, please, all due respect. We, uh, I know, and I, I, you know, I take it with a grain of salt. I, no, I'm not sure, but, but I think, you know, I'm just this what I'm supposed to think you're No, not yet. yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've been thinking about this nonstop since we started this in last March. We saw this coming, and we knew that I mean, people were talking about getting from March to the summer, and we were thinking, oh no, this is going to be March until where, where we are now. So we meet routinely in teams in bar and RTI. We have a list of every single kid who's not passing the class. We talk about them every single week. We send interventions. We make hundreds and hundreds of phone calls. And we've set up a lot of these things to try to make sure that no one goes unnoticed or is left behind. And I think, and so what AJ is saying is that because we had such a, a sort of a weird schedule to, be, to begin with and trying to figure out okay, how to rotate the kids in, a lot of these one-off experiences ended up being the mechanism by which we tried to make sure that everybody had what they needed. And so it becomes a big jigsaw puzzle to try to overlay something on top of it. So which is why we tried to make the time work where we could try to piece it all together still without pulling the rug out from all of these things that we put in place to prevent exactly kind of what you were saying would happen, the concern that we would miss kids, lose kids, not be able to give them what they need. So, what would it feel like if we gave them an hour? How, like, what would that do? Like, a, you know, an hour, a 60 minute watch. I, I, you, I have not been part of your pain. Yeah. So I'm just going um, it there. I think, I think we can definitely do it if that is the wishes. Um, I mean, it, it's time. I, I certainly get that. I, again, I come back to worrying about a couple of pieces. So now, you know, from a student standpoint, with these extra structured time we're giving them for a student that has a, you know, three core classes this semester. And again, part of it is our day one and our day two typical classes have a nice balance to them. Everything happens over two days. We have some students who may have had a tutorial first semester. We had no issues with their schedule. Second semester, their schedule is now much more full. We still have to provide those special education services second semester as well. It's not like they can just go away and be like, hey, we did our best to teach you to read for half a year and now, you know, so those are still continuing, but there's no time in the schedule for that. Like that, because normally it would have happened every other day for the whole year you can't just kind of squish that and condense that in. So I think that that would just greatly reduce the time for those things. Again, everything is a give and take. I mean, we all recognize that fact. We have a set number of hours of school. And so anything we put in, something comes up. And so I think we're just trying to balance what that, what that looks like. Our schedule is incredibly complicated in normal year. This schedule, <laughs> We have a series of documents trying to figure out where people are, certain blocks, who's doing what, when. So when we're trying to do this, we're trying to do it while still satisfying all these other things we put in place. Mm -hmm. And that's why we land on these weird things that don't seem to make sense to somebody whose head hasn't been in this. It looks like, well, what's the point, right? And it's just been a nightmare trying to figure out how to get all these pieces to fit together. 
without losing all the supports for all the kids that we we know need them. And so those are the things that we're just trying to figure out and do it in a way that isn't going to upheave an entire kid's, you know, end of the year. I had three kids coming in today in different spaces in the building because they were failing their classes. So I had one kid in the, one of the counselor's offices who was out having knee surgery, working on Play-Doh. I had another kid upstairs. I had another kid in the conference room working on some classes and he needed to meet with his teachers. And I was running around from block to, you know, place to place to make sure that they had everything they needed. And all kids got caught up by being here on this day. They were failing all their classes yesterday. They came in. They had some targeted intervention and they were able to get their grades up to passing. And without, and some of these kids, you have to fight to get them to come in because they're like, oh no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I got it, I got a plan. And this goes on for a couple of weeks and then you know, no, no, you don't, your plan's not working, so can we try my plan? So then they come in and just being in a place that's structured for them makes it easier for them to get it done. That's kind of what we want. Right, yes. that's our point. We want, we, that's what we want, but we want it for all of them. And what I, well, unfortunately, we're not in a place where we can get it for all of them because of the spacing requirements right. that we have right now. We have our building three days a week. So I think what we're trying to do through all the bar and the RTI stuff is we know who's in trouble and we're chasing them down and we're getting them in here. Um, the other day I called the parents and said, hey, I'm just calling because I'm worried about so-and-so not passing math. I think it would be really helpful to come in on Wednesday. So can you give me a call back? We can talk about getting him in next week. I walked out of my office 20 minutes later and he was standing in the guidance office asking for me. And I wasn't expecting him to be there, but just being there for a day allowed him to get a chunk of work done in math. And I get what so you want for all kids. I don't know how we do it for all kids. Right, in right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I just am seeing what happens when that kid isn't called in. And, you know, it's, it, you're doing exactly what the kids need. There's no question about it. Um, it's just, we're just hitting a small number of them. And I guess our fear is we may miss, I, I feel like we, I'm afraid we're going to risk missing more if we lose some of this in-person time for some of these kids with more remote time, because it's gonna limit our ability to balance the two. Yeah, and I look at it, I mean, sort of from the ninth grade perspective, working with ninth graders that, you know, wanting to have that balance where we can continue inviting them in. I have three more phone calls with kids that are gonna start next, next Wednesday again. Um, Brenda has been off the charts with allowing transportation for that. I mean, the, the number of times I call her on a Tuesday afternoon and say, Brenda, tomorrow, I know I know we said I'll give you a weekend, but it's Tuesday and the parent just called me back and can you bring it tomorrow? Um, and the answer is always yes. So I guess, that, you know, and again, that's just, it's the balance. We're trying to, you know, and I think we have more capacity to invite more students in at this time. I mean, you know, we, we have families that we're calling and, you know, at this point, they're not interested. Um, and we're continuing to work with them. Okay, hey, are you interested now? Are you interested now? And I think the concern is the more structured it becomes for everybody, the less responsive it can be for those that need it in the moment. And that's just, again, that's where I come back to, like we're, we're just trying to balance that. But I mean, I think if in increased time on the remote day, I mean, I think we could look at increasing that if that's what your concern is. So we, we looked at a 40 minute model um, and it would, I know that the, the spoke thing is something that is just a disagreement. Um, kids can still make it and not miss the 40 minute model. Um, so can you, so I think I'm missing a piece here. Yeah. Can you explain to me if I'm looking at our current yellow schedule? Yes. Right? Yeah. Remote on Monday and Tuesday. Yes. They're at one hour. Yeah. For classes. Yeah. You're talking about let's say let's just take tenth grade. Yeah. They come in on Fridays. Yeah. And let's say we're going to make Thursday their additional remote day. Sure. Yeah. Why can't we follow the same remote day on Thursday that we follow on Monday and Tuesday? So on Monday and Tuesday, do you look on on there? See that the yeah. The, the two-hour chunk in the middle. We don't have that. 
Yeah. That person. doesn't happen during our in-person bell schedule. So no, that's where we have like live lunches in block three. So that's where when those kids typically travel to and from Boca Monday and Tuesday, yeah. we rearrange those AP extension blocks in particular order to make sure that no vocational student would be missing those blocks and that would that's basically a change over time. So kids can safely get from Sanford to home to get to block three okay. and that kids can safely do the reverse for the other sessions. Because yeah and what happens is on say Thursday like you described we can't run both schedules at once because we don't have sort of sophomore teachers. Our sophomore, you know, our art class has, has is sections of nine through twelve. Our PE classes are nine through twelve. Well, our, you're not talking about core class, or those are with those, those are anyway. Right. Are, yeah, but there's also a lot of classes where you know our math teachers, all of our math teachers teach pre-calculus, that sort of one on AP calculus um, paths to seniors, um, a number of sections of paths. So that's where they're not. Like they're not, they can't be locked into a different schedule on that day. I don't, I don't know. I'm so, what would your 30 minute or 40 minute proposal look like if I'm looking at this time frame that we have right now? Yep. And so, we go Thursday, they're going to first block, day two, block one is from 8 to 8.40. Yep. Okay. It would be probably, we did 8.30 to 9 if we did a half hour, so let's say 8.20 to 9. Nine. Uh, I'm making this up a little bit because we had done the 30 minutes, but nine. So, so give me the 30 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes. So 830 to 9 o'clock, 915 to 945. And then that break happens. So it's 12 to 1230 and 1245 to 115. And that would be at whatever day. Whatever we needed. Right. So again, we can, you know, we can certainly a little bit. And I, yeah. yeah I Chris, just so you know, the fact that this computer is not a touch screen and noise the crap. <laughs> <laughs> Were the teachers that you talked to looking at using this time to uh, just have it be a review or homework or new items? I mean, 30 minutes isn't much to, like, what would they use that for from an academic standpoint? Yeah, I think it depends on, on how the class is doing. If you know, they notice that students didn't do particularly well in the assessment, that could be time for some reteaching and revision work. If they didn't quite get to something in the previous class, they could sort of extend that activity into that particular time. Um, they could have kids get together and collaborate and do peer reviewed editing or other activities that maybe they didn't get a chance to do. So I think it depends on um, what the teacher sees as the best utilization of that time, just like you would on any other in-person or remote class session. Yeah. I think that to AJ's point before, I think that when we don't have kids missing as much, um, it can be more academically focused. I think if we bump up that time to where they know that, you know, I've got seven kids who have to leave early, or in my next block, I've got nine kids coming late. It changes how you can kind of progress in the curriculum because it's you have to figure out a way to get them caught up, and it, you know yeah. the value of time changes. So. Yeah. One of the conversations I had with folks was feeling like I think a lot of folks are trying to give assessments in person as much as possible to be able to allow students to ask questions. It's really challenging sometimes online. And I think one of the things I heard was that this extra time, you know, again, I'll use juniors and seniors and we'll play it out that they, they're in person on Wednesday and then they get this chunk of time remotely, knowing that they had another dedicated chunk of time the next day, even though it's remote, they would feel much more comfortable being able to spend some more time reviewing before an assessment because right now they're trying to fit it in that block. If you don't fit it in, if it doesn't turn it into you by Wednesday, Potentially, you're, you're kind of trying to get them to get it to you, where this way you'd have that next day to be dedicated that you know you're going to see them on the screen again. So, hey, if we don't finish, that's all right. You've all got, you know, 11 of you have four more questions to finish. We can take the first few minutes and do those four questions. So, I think that, again, it's, it will be variable, like Ellie said, but I think that would be one benefit of having that time. 
I know with all the high school seniors that I deal with on a regular basis are going to be mad, but they're getting a four day weekend and it's, we need to change something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and we're doing a lot of carving out for specialty things. Yeah. Should we be flipping it over and dealing with the core first and then adding the specialty? Yeah. Right. So these, see these are, these would be core classes that kids, that's the kind of why, well, there's, the reasons why we remove the electives are very complicated, but it has to do with those mixed grade levels and incompatible schedules for teachers and students. We ran a test on those, and 60% of mixed grade level electives end up not stating the model. So to make it more simplified for students, families, all of us, that's why we focus on the cores. And the cores are where we wanted to focus on anyway to make sense towards progress, towards graduation, um, and sort of the greatest impact there. The concern is when those kids start getting pulled out of those cores to those other other areas, which a lot of them, like your special education student, you have a case management meeting, they have to all reschedule those if we took up too much of that time where they're already using. There's just it's the, that balance. And where do languages have, fall in this? Huh? Where do languages fall? So they would fall into those mixed grade level electives, most likely. Yeah, I think we so they would so still, you would still have those classes on Monday, Tuesday, and you're in person. Oh, yes, yes. 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 It's just the, the extra 30 minutes or 40 minutes yeah. or whatever we decide for yes. remote days, you're not going to get those extra classes. That not, extra time correct. not going to be extra day. Those wouldn't see an increase. So, yeah, so nothing is decreasing. This yes. is a com complete add to what's okay. happening now. Yeah, so nothing, it's not like no one is losing the time. Do you have a rough idea for uh, like juniors and seniors with the current schedule that they've only got a couple of classes that they're taking? Like how many are electives? Like uh, the average junior or senior is going to be getting how many 30 minute blocks? Yeah, it, it's really variable based on student schedule and whether they are taking early college courses or vocational programs um, or depending upon their day one versus day two sort of fall of, of those classes, um, but all seniors should be enrolled in a core social studies, a math experience, a core English, um, and, a, and, and a core science. Um, but it, again, would depend on how it fell. And then some of them are enrolled in, in more of that based on AP courses that they're taking, which would fall under this model. Obviously, four would be the maximum based upon those the four blocks. And a senior project. On and senior and project. senior project. Thank you. To, to try and give seniors a little bit of extra time to get that push to get those projects done if they haven't. Um, yeah, and we did, and, and I don't pretend, guys, that it was perfect, but we, we went through one, I just wanted to make sure every student would see a benefit, and Travis, to your point, I'm not sure they will sort of recognize the benefit, so I get that, uh -huh. sort of from our perspective, that they would see a time bump up, so which we don't have a group of students who don't, and initially it looks like every student saw a bump up, but it was some saw three or four, depending on their schedule. Some were more of a way. I, I did find a couple that were one just because of their, their schedule. One. Well, yeah. you're going to see a lot of the seniors are going to be one or two. So anybody that right. had English and math in the first semester mm -hmm. isn't, you know. Any of the science and history. And yeah. Depending yeah. on their AP, so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. senior project. Mm -hmm. Overall, I might often want to get the ninth graders in here for one more day. Mm -hmm. uh, I honestly was kind of hoping for more public input in regards to this after our discussion last week. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear any, and I didn't even see right. any mm -hmm. feedback or anything out there about this. I know we kind of got sidetracked with another issue that took place that kind of pushed everything off, but right. um, I didn't hear of any backlash or anything out there about our discussions that we had last week. Uh, I personally, I don't mind the extra day of 30 minutes. I think it, it kind of, in my mind, it kind of works the way I was hoping. I, obviously, I'd like to see more, yeah. but I understand that it's some, and it still allows us to get to those at-risk kids, but it also takes in these kids that are not really at-risk, they're not really 
that Excel level, they're kind of in the middle that have had literally 40, 40 weekends or vice versa. Um, it's because they're, they're doing that work, they're getting their job done, so they don't need to do the extra work on the other two days. This at least gives them a chance to have some more interaction and discussion and catch up. So, yeah. I personally would go to option three. The order for number three. Let <laughs> me confirm that option three was the right one. Yeah. It was, you got it. Okay, good, you got it. It's <laughs> a double win. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Travis. I, I feel for the, the middle of the road kids. Um, and I think this will address part of the issues with that and also get the ninth graders. And I just worry about like next year, how we're going to bring these kids back up to where they're supposed to be. Maybe that's something we have to make sure we have enough money in the budget for to help with special supports next year. But I definitely um, feel that number three is our best option here. I don't, and I don't think we need to actually add an face, extra FaceTime time for the ninth graders. With the extra day. They're doing the Wednesday in person day. Yeah. yeah. Makes that it's not complicated for them. Right. So I'm between two and three. Um, I like the idea in a perfect world of having both of them a combination, but given the total amount of time, um, it's, so it's still being split and it slivers. I can, I see the benefit to it. I like it. But then I think with option two, if we put the hundred percent of the time there, at least it touches all the grades. So that's the only thing as far as that goes. So if the ninth graders go back an extra day, do they still get an even more extra 30 minute? Or they just get the extra day? We've talked about some of them shifting it to 10, 11, and 12 to get that extra um, right. remote time. So right. those guys get a whole enough extra day of in-person time. It makes so it one day, they're not two. So you're talking about they get an extra. They an extra one day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. that evens them out like eighth grade right so, now. Yeah. Then it would be sort of district-wide you know, it's, it's, this isn't perfect, but grades six through nine would be on in person a level playing field as far as two in person and two synchronous remote, if that makes sense. I know the middle school has three, they see their kids twice, maybe split over three days or whatever, but it would be very similar between those four grades. Do we have any other remote board members besides Stephanie and Nancy? Oh, I can't see if anyone else is on. I can't. Well, like it. Uh, no, I don't see anybody else. No. But I don't think. Well, it's true that she wasn't going to be here. Right. Yes. I don't think Nancy's here. Yeah. I think it was she. Yeah. <laughs> so we, so we want to make a here? we want to make a motion to move. We want to make a motion to do something, or we want to table it. I guess. I mean, I don't mind making a motion, but, but I say when you're, I mean, with the discussion that you guys have had, I think we feel comfortable moving in that direction. I mean, I think that's what we were looking for. All right, so I'll make a motion that we accept the high school's plan of option three. I'll second that. Now it's a discussion time. I mean, I'm. I just personally, I'm in favor of um, option one. So if we could split these two up, I guess, um, I would be in favor of option one. I, I'm grateful for the work that you guys put into coming up with this. I, I, I don't, I, it's not something that I'm, that I can get behind. I'm not, not because I'm opposed to what you, I just don't think it's I don't think it's gonna um, I don't know I'll just yeah but 
we'll leave it up to that's that's my only discussion piece. Nancy, Stephanie. So if we're doing a vote, um, same place that I was before. Uh, two or three for me. Yeah, I would say three for me. I got, well, I'm just waiting to, like, okay. I think we're still in the discussion phase, okay. so we haven't gotten to the place where we're, we have a motion on the table, and it's just, we're just discussing whether or not we divide it up into two, but it's two, two motions. Okay. That's fine. Um, all in favor? Seven, three. My motion, left and three. Great. Okay. Okay. So did we decide on that? Was that 30 minutes or we're just doing 30 or not any other okay. time? Yeah. I just I didn't say specific time. I kind of just wanted to look the actual proposal was, so I guess the proposal was 30. But I think we'll leave that up to them, I guess, if they want to figure out 30 or 40, but okay. Right. And what time, can you say again what time that day starts and finishes and which classes are going to get on which day? Well, it's not it's not quite as clean as what class on what day, you know, because it will be class dependent because, you know, if a pre-calculus class is made up of 10th and 11th graders, it has to be on Thursday. But if I'm typically a sophomore and I come in on Fridays, most of my sophomore classes might occur on Wednesday. So you're not doing most of the sophomore classes on Wednesday or whatever? Most will be. Okay, yeah. so if you're a sophomore, I think most, most on Wednesday, I think mm -hmm. having junior, uh, juniors and seniors most on Thursday, yeah. we talked about, and ninth graders, variable, we were thinking Wednesday, but I don't think that's 100% at this point, it's kind of seeing which day landed the best, between Wednesday or Friday. We'd basically uh, go through each class individually. Ninth graders are on the table. Ninth graders are coming in. Oh, correct. Coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. correct, sorry. Yep. Yes. yes. So 10, 11, 12, most 10th graders are going to be Wednesday. Wednesday, most 11 and 12, probably Thursday. Okay. And because we're talking about core classes, it really will be most. There will yeah. be some kids that will. Exactly. But that we're not talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'm trying to think of outside of AP. There's a couple that talk to mind, like AP Bio. Right. But the vast majority of 10th graders are going to be. Yeah, you got it. You got it. And Absolutely. The time of day is what? 8.30 to. 8.30 I personally would rather see 40 minutes. Does anybody else feel that way or is everybody else in line with the 30? We can try to revise it up. See if we can get 40 minutes. I agree. If you get it, even 10 minutes, it's just yeah. stretch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think if it works, then yeah, 40 is great. If it doesn't work, 30 is better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Thank you for all the work you did. Now you can move on to graduation. You ready? <laughs> go. Graduation now. Yeah. Huh? I well, love graduation. <laughs> My specialty. <laughs> I didn't see you outside with us well, great today. Like <laughs> it was raining. Uh, we have a letter ready to go to seniors, um, hopefully tomorrow, um, with some updates about graduation and end of year uh, experiences. The yearbook is it's not ready to go. It's ready to be mailed in, and it'll be ready uh, in June. And Cynthia placed it. You know Cynthia placed it? She's uh, an uh, amazing uh, advisor for the senior class. She also does the yearbook with her daughter, Sigil. And I think she does the best yearbook I've ever seen come out of high school, so she does an excellent job. She's got all the pictures in now, and now it has to go to the publisher. It takes a while to come out there. Um, caps and gowns have been, well, will have been ordered by the end of this month. We have a group of uh, senior parents called Friends of the Class of 2021. They've been gathering donations for creating the calendar. 
to raise money for the, uh, for the class and specifically to help some kids who can't afford the dues to pay for uh, like t-shirts and the cap and gown, that kind of thing. And they've already raised quite, quite a bit of money. Um, senior slideshow will be uh, completed by Cynthia Playstead again and her, her daughter. Um, that will be ready to go. In uh, June, we'll be working with parents to fundraise and plan for some special events for the seniors. Um, and graduation is set for the 12th of June. Rain or shine? Um, <laughs> yeah, the, Cynthia, Cynthia has met with a group of uh, senior parents twice now. And Allie and I met with Shannon Rogers this morning, who's kind of spearheading uh, the group. And they've got some really great ideas about things to do with the senior class. So we're looking forward to the end of the year. And Allie was outside today. Yes, we're Kevin Moore. Yeah. I think AJ was out there too. Yeah, he was. <laughs> Trying to measure the beer, how you can get uh, all these people uh, socially distanced on a football field. Mm -hmm. yeah, it takes a lot of uh, math. Math? Thanks, <laughs> uh, AJ, a former math teacher, is very helpful. Uh, <laughs> and I think uh, they figured out a way to get uh, quite a few people out there. Uh, it's going to be interesting. It'll we'll be interesting. All be together. So that's what we hope for. So things are coming together at the end of the year. Well, there'll be a series of more specific um, letters and things after that one once we absolutely know things like ticket numbers and time of day. Um, but we just want to be really, really sure before we release that um, out there because we know that it's, this is a meaningful event. We don't want to promise something that we can't give. So, but it's looking good. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Anything else in the, I guess, high school update category? <laughs> <laughs> we can cover all that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Run away. <laughs> Wait, that's my bedtime. Oh, it's so early. So my one of my first colors was uh, last week I asked a question for some data that I haven't seen that yet. Oh boy, specifically to what? The adults versus kids COVID yeah. cases. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And he was working on that. Yeah. So. There were a couple of things that we were talking about. So just checking out. Um, and then on the good news front, Yay. I don't know if people have already seen it, but Northburg Rescue, as well as a bunch of other emergency services in the area, have all teamed up to offer the clinics that will be happening at the high school. Uh, April 13th is going to be for 50 plus in staff at the high school, be from 3 to 8. And then May 11th will be for anybody else that's eligible, which is 16 and up at the high school. If you go on to Norfolk Rescue or Fire or any of the Facebook pages out there, there's a link to sign up yep. for all of those clicks. Did you say it's yeah. the J&J one? It is the J&J one. Yeah. So, okay. April 13th. No. Yes. No. So yes. April, April 13th, 13th is 50, 50 up in staff. Yeah. Which, and if you sign up, is it like a waitlist thing, or are you sort of, if you sign up, you're guaranteed? You'll be, I'm going to make the assumption that it's going to run it the same way as we've been running the Sanford one, is that you'll be given a time slot and told what time to show up. All right. But yeah, it's an assumption. No, I can uh, I can confirm that as of about five minutes ago. I got a text from my sister that said, hey, uh, I just got a date and time of April 13th at the high school for my show. And she has a specific time. Okay. And she registered and got an email back. So I'm going to say that I'm 15 know. older category and I'm waitlisted, but I'm just curious if I'm, if this is probably just an easier, especially if it's a one shot deal, it might just be easier to do this one. So yeah. I would recommend, well, yes, the Johnson & Johnson is a one shot deal. Yeah, if you're waitlisted, I would yeah. call yeah. the phone number for the Sanford one. And I'm seeing that you're having more luck on the phone than you are on the internet. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, Some people are having more luck on the internet so on the phone, but I had more luck on the phone. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, because um, she she asked me, and the reason I say this is she asked me just before this meeting, hey, do I? She'd never attempted at all. Hey, do I just go to this link and register? And I said, yes, that's what you do. And so she's already on, and this is her first day. I've been working there. There was a lot of teachers this week come through the Sanford right. one. Yeah. So yeah. we're making progress slowly but awesome. surely. Awesome. Great. Right. We're getting numbers while we're talking because it's not all here, but any other buzzers? So, we, so would this be the opportune time to bring up what we talked about as far as information? Sure, if you want to. Yep. If we're still in public, is that good? That fine? Yeah, I think okay. so. I don't know where you're going with this. <laughs> okay. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I think so. So I think that the feedback that I'm getting is I think that people have misconceptions about um, what's going on. They just see in their mind, hey, we vaccinated the teachers is a priority but now you're not opening up the school, what the heck? Mm -hmm. And they don't understand the complexity of what we're seeing. And so in their mind, they're talking to other people and they, they don't get it. Is there a way that we can put out some information via the website? I mean, where I want more public input at the meetings, yes. But is it just a way to sort of attack all this information out there because people don't understand the complexity of, of just why don't we just go back to normal classes? Yeah, we all like that. Yeah. So, what is there some way we can combat that with information? I'm gonna point that towards Audra. <laughs> um, Steve used to do a newsletter on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, it was a could, could have been yeah. for me. I don't the last month. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's where we can come back to yeah. some yes. of those things. Yeah, maybe we just create some articles to put in there. It's just that I don't think that they're, they're getting it. And I don't mean it in a negative way. They just they don't understand. It's not just as easy as we'll put all the kids back in school. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and so we got we to gotta find a way to get some information out there so they understand. Not to this extent, because they're never going to you know, mm -hmm. read it all, but just get some words out there. We're doing everything we can to get them as much direct education as we can. Yeah. Okay. And there are a lot of complex things that go into it, right as we see. Right. So just to sort of hit that negative, you know, tide some way. Right. And, and I don't know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can do that. Oh, hold on, I'm getting myself in. So I'm just trying to get your numbers together. So. If we were looking at just um, the cases that we have of confirmed COVID, um, it's also 27, 33, 35, 42. Um, <laughs> So it's like 87 complete COVID cases in our district over the past, like that's students and staff together. For the school year. For the school year. That's been reported to us. Right. Yes, that we, yeah, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so give me a second and I'll add up my people. So, um, 10, so 14. Let's check that again, just to be sure. 10, 15. Yeah. 31 of those are staff members. So 56 are kids. So did you have to make I mean, and I think theoretically that sort of matches population mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So mm -hmm. Okay. Any other items? 
We can't adjourn, but we, have to, we can right, clearly state that session. no okay, decisions, okay. no decisions will be made after this, from right. this point forward. We are going into executive session for I don't know what. I don't know. Not on here, so we have this. Executive session for one MR. I will make a motion to go into executive session for one MRSA 4056A employment of officials appointment employee. Sorry. All right, we're just going to give Chris a few minutes, a few seconds to get us off.